All right, so we'll call the meeting to order at uh, 12.01 p.m. Um, in attendance, we have um, Kyle Harris and uh, Nellie Marvel from the Cannabis Control Board, um, Billy Coster, Jacob Politzer, and Stephanie Smith um, on the Sustainability Subcommittee with uh, Tom Nolasco and Gina uh, Cranwinkle from NACB, um, and uh, technical expert John Wakefield um, also. And then do we have any members of the public? We've got three members of the public. Three members of the public. Sweet. Okay. So first order of business, um, approve uh, last Wednesday's meeting minutes. Um, Stephanie, Billy, we had a chance to review and any feedback or uh, changes? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I'll motion to approve the meeting minutes. I'll second. All right. All in favor of approving the meeting minutes, say aye. 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 Meeting minutes are approved. Um, okay. Next order of business. Wanted to confirm the schedules. Um, I realized that uh, we had discussed the meeting times in a couple of meetings ago. Um, I, I tried to edit change the calendars, realize that it was only happening on my side. So I wanted to, now that it's like next week, um, confirm with both, well, I guess everyone on this call, um, for October 20th's meeting, we'll be discussing social equity. Does 12 to 1 p.m. still work for everyone? Looks like Billy's a yes, yes Kyle's a yes. Stephanie? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, I will work with Nelly to get that updated. And then um, the other two meetings that are on this calendar would be the 25th and the 28th. So I think we should be good with that. Yeah. And I will just add that, and I think everybody here knows this, that the subcommittees are in um, all in a different stage of kind of wrapping up the first iteration of their work. And I see value in, in continuing this committee for the next three meetings or so because i still think we have some outstanding stuff to accomplish ahead of um ahead of november so um like for instance the compliance and enforcement subcommittee will be wrapping up on on monday i know that the market structure committee is already kind of adjourned for for the time being so on and so forth but um just want to make sure this committee is all on the same page that um, this meeting and then three more i think we should have a good baseline understanding of recommendations and then Jacob will help kind of uh, provide me with the overview of the work of the subcommittee. I'll present that work to my fellow board members and if everybody feels like we're moving in a, a good direction, we'll, we'll um, turn all of those recommendations into uh, proposed rules um, and, then, mm -hmm. and then engage the subcommittee back at that point in time um, to make sure we've, you know, we're, we're our rulemaking has has captured to the extent that we're able the vision of the subcommittee. Yes, and on that wow. point, I have in the bottom of the agenda. So I am creating a progress report, um, probably in a slide um, style for Kyle on where we are with energy, water, waste, and then after today, um, air quality. Uh, so can you share that with the rest of the board? And I'll share that with. Um, you, Billy, and Stephanie. Um, so it's going to be an overview of everything that we agreed upon, outstanding gray areas, et cetera. And then in the last two meetings, or not next week, but the following week, we'll be using those to kind of find, uh, figure out like what are the remaining um, issues or issues we haven't agreed upon um, to provide Kyle with kind of um, uh, background information, um, justifications for things or other things to kind of consider that we, um, you know, would need more information. I think kind of like with the waste on how the state's deciding to categorize that and things like that. Um, and then um, my understanding, Kyle, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we're going to yeah, provide you with kind of recommendations. But yeah, you are kind of like what you just said, going to be turning that into actual like um, regulation wording. Yeah, and again, like some of our work, you know, I think last week was a good example of that, the water conversation. A, a lot of that is already built out at ANR. It's just understanding how and where we slide in and identifying those gray areas, like taking subsections of section, certain sections of the RIPs and figuring out where they slide into ANR. And so we're not planning to start from scratch, um, but just 
do so where, where it's appropriate to do so and then uh, make sure our our rules or proposed rules um, are, are pointing people to the right portions of other other state code. Does that sound good, Billy? Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that approach. Um, and I think everything you and Jacob have just explained makes sense. My only request would be that to get kind of the, the directional documents as soon as possible, because as you all know, we've got a lot of different programs who've been involved in this conversation. I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to kind of get eyes on something before it gets too far ahead. So yeah, absolutely. sounds good. And just, you know, the more time we can have with it, the better, but understand you're, you're running hard on a number of different levels. Yeah. And, and Billy, you know, I think, I think it, as we have questions, even with those recommendations, as we build out proposed regulations, we'll, we'll be in contact with you, whether it's me, Bryn, or David, to make sure we've, we've characterized things in a consistent manner with, you know, with how your experts at ANR are, are doing so. Super. Thank you. Yep. Um, Stephanie, any questions um, on that? No. All right. Awesome. All right. So then we'll just jump right in. Uh, thank you, Billy, for sending over um, the uh, kind of draft final hemp uh, regulations. Um, it looks like that comes from your department, Stephanie, so I'm sure you're familiar with that. And we've got John on the call as well. So um, I kind of just started to review what was written there and kind of what we're seeing from other states. So we can just get it started with uh, the open burning. And so I saw that it was mentioned that ags are, if it's an agriculture product, it's exempt. So I was wondering where things stand since cannabis is um, classified as a commercial product. So does that also mean it's banned under the APCR? And I guess that's probably a question for you, John. Yeah, it's not um, for, under our regs. It's not necessarily uh, commercial versus uh, residential. Um, there's really no commercial component to it. Um, really, you know, you are allowed to burn brush uh, things from property maintenance. If you're, you know, if it's a if it's a residential situation, if you're in a landscaping situation where you're collecting that type of brush. Um, from a place we do uh, we do require a permit from that we we had this situation um, a couple years ago with with a uh, with a grower who was trying to burn their stocks and and um, the the other uh, the other waste from it and what we found was that we can't because there's alternate means of disposal of it um, composting we can't under our regulations issue a permit for it and it's not listed as a permissible burn. Our open burning regulations are more complicated than you'd think, and we are actually working on clarifying them. Um, but really, that's that's the basis for it, is that we, we it's not something that we're allowed to issue a permit for because there are alternate means of disposal, and, and the, the, the main one being composting that we look at. So question on that, because we do see, I've seen it um, like here and there, when there is um, like, disease or like a lot of powdery mildew or something that you know shouldn't be on that grow that'll be kind of, like kind of become endemic um and also should not go into composting or kind of the um i guess organic waste stream so wondering if there is exemptions for that um rather than having that all go to landfill there are there are certain provisions um that i think we might be able to apply to that um, I, I might want to get back to you with a more official answer on that. Um, you know, aside from, I, I think the question that would come up um, for me would be, is there an on-site, um, you know, is there an on-site composting capability where it's not going to a certain area to be composting and, and mixed with composting, you know, as, as something that's going to be sold to the public as a nutrient or, you know, a growing, uh, agent is you know can you is there a place on the property where you can just pile it and let it decompose um you know and and that's kind of what we and and if there is that opportunity then we you know it's not something that we can issue a permit to burn but we do have provisions that allow for burning when it comes to to plant disease and, and certain things like that so i you know unfortunately I, I don't know that i can give you an exact answer without you know a specific situation um, Stephanie, do you have anything to add? I feel like that's in your purview. 
Uh, no, I mean, uh, actually, John, hi, John, it's nice to meet you. Uh, we've had multiple conversations about this relative to the hemp world, um, and we understand the rule as it applies to the, the hemp world. Um, and, you know, likewise, if it's not a commercial composting operation, um, it seems reasonable. And if there's space on the site for it to be um, composted on site or disposed of on site, I guess is maybe a more appropriate term there. Um, where it doesn't impact the operation, of course, you have to find that location. And then, you know, the the um, the uh, air quality and uh, climate division needs to make deter determinations about what's appropriate and an application of their rules. And just as John pointed out, and for any regulatory program, the facts of the situation matter. So <laughs> we would defer to them. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, okay. So it seems like that is covered. So I guess. Moving on to the public nuisance odor um, issue. So I was wondering with the AQCD, it mentions there that it's done on like a complaint basis. Was wondering if that is only how the AQCD works. Um, and, and then wondering like how we should view it with recommendations or, or requirements um, as far as like preventative issues. Sure. Um... I think is is you know uh, it is complaint driven. It's a hundred percent complaint driven. Uh, you know it's uh, that that and unfortunately uh, you know uh, something slightly subjective as an odor uh, where a case has to be built for a violation um, that can really really strain our resources. Um, so yes, we are we are relying on on hearing uh, complaints from the public and additionally as it being a, a public nuisance, um, you know. We don't have a definition of public nuisance, but we, you know, it's it's any considerable number of people, which we've always, uh, I, I try and keep the bar low and try and keep it at two distinct residential properties, or, you know, it could be businesses as well in some certain situations, but at least two, because we do have a lot of, you know, and we do have a lot of situations where it is just one complainant and I can't apply that rule at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess a follow-up question is how does this interact with like local permitting? Like if I'm going to put in an indoor grow and I get approval from the city, you know, they know that there is going to be some odor and they've approved it and then I get all of these complaints, you know, is there an intersectionality between that of, well, the city is permitted to like, you know, some does or does your department, I guess, kind of take the view that if there's all of these complaints, like you're gonna have the shutdown operations if you can't remediate it properly. Um, you know, the local permit really doesn't play a part. I mean, I, you know, a couple of years ago, I was in discussions with um, regional states uh, about the cannabis industry where, you know, Massachusetts was, you know, a little bit ahead of the other states because of where they were. And, um, you know, they were they they didn't they tried to advise me that the the best thing that i could do would be to get the word out to the local municipalities and make sure their understanding of of what you know what the side effects could be of allowing these businesses in certain areas mm -hmm. uh, you know i haven't been able to unfortunately put you know put much time into that kind of effort um but really when it comes down to it you know it, whether it's approved uh locally on the municipal level really wouldn't play a factor for us um, you know, and, and, and in general, if, if the equipment's not big enough, they're not going to have a permit from us, any of the drying equipment or extraction type equipment, um, which generally we haven't seen move into Vermont yet. So um, we, would, we would investigate under our regulations. Um, and at that point, we don't, um, you know, we don't necessarily shut anyone down uh, immediately. Um, you know, uh, if, if there are steps that can be taken as far as, you know, additional, if we're talking about an indoor grow, if we're talking about, uh, you know, additional controls that haven't been explored yet, you know, we would, we would require them to look into that, you know, um, as timely as they could. Um, okay. I, I think, um, were you asking though, I think, you know, it, it's certainly possible that municipalities would have their own ordinances related to odor. Um, that could apply to these facilities that they could enforce independent of the state air quality regulations. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I just... and on that, I know that 164 does give um, special attention to municipalities as it relates to odor. Um, so I think, you know, one of the ways that we could handle that and we're discussing kind of internally is if once and, and as we start to build an application um, for a prospective license holder, there's going to be a certain number of things that you know if if 
that you're going to have to go to your town and, and make sure that you've checked a lot of boxes at the local level so that you don't come to us before you go to your local level and then there's this back and forth so on and so forth so um, just recognizing that they're given that kind of zoning capability in 164 it's something that we're hopeful but we'll be built into the application so that ducks are in a row before a, a license application is submitted um, to the okay. cannabis control board gotcha yeah and i guess to i probably should ask this question so it sounds like john the aqcd is going to require some kind of odor mitigation you know i don't think we have the authority to require it until after we've proven there's a violation um, gotcha. we'd, we'd love to see it on there you know I, I would love to see anything you could the local uh regulations allow for them to do before we need to get involved um you know that'd be fantastic because again you know an order case for us is is many many site visits uh many corroborations of the odor uh so that we can be witnesses should it you know should it actually progress that far and like i said just a, an absolute strain on on the limited resources i have on my staff so anything we can do on the front end to prevent it from happening but but again our 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 authority is, is slightly limited in that area until until it's proven that there's been a violation okay yeah i will go through um i know i attended a bunch of meetings about it a few years ago so colorado um implemented i'm going to be in colorado or Denver, but implemented like an odor ordinance and kind of the way they did it. i know it had to do with like smelling of it or like those machines but it was if you essentially adequately size odor remediation equipment you were somewhat kind of exempt from these complaints and they kind of um i think were assessing kind of what that meant so i can see if there um are um yeah uh, information on that because i know like carbon filtration on the exhaust airstream is kind of the most common and it looks like it does around 50 to 98 percent of it i know there's also like fog machines and other technology so i can try to get that information on what we're seeing is like effective odor remediation equipment that potentially we can offer guidance um to um application or uh, uh, licensees i guess um my other question I had kind of on there is, yeah, does your department um, have kind of approved remediation controls from other industries? Um, yes, I mean, there there are, I mean, it's more technologies than individual suppliers or manufacturers, yes, but, um, you know, it, it really depends on what the pollutant is. If it's, if it's um, you know, it's uh, is, is gonna be the biggest one. I'm sorry, VOCs. Uh, VOCs. Yes, yes. So you, in general, like uh, burning off of the VOCs, you know, before before they're emitted, um, that you know, that's a control technology. And yes, I mean, we can we can certainly advise people on the best control technology. Um, and, and you know, we have. I don't know if we have an official list, and and if we do have an official list, it's it's certainly unfortunately not specific to hemp and, and marijuana cultiva cultivation. Um, but we can certainly offer guidance. Gotcha, yeah. And I guess like a follow-up is like, is your department kind of ready for an additional 200 to 300, you know, people asking questions? Um, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. We are a little bit behind and, and forgive me, I am a little bit behind. I, I was under the impression this meeting was next week. And so I did get a chance to skim through that Colorado material, um, but I, I haven't done, uh, and we haven't done a lot of research on this uh yet we knew we knew it was coming uh and, and we've tried to think about it and be proactive but it's it's been difficult to be honest um yeah, yeah. um no no worries on like reviewing that material and i'll actually put you in touch with caitlin urso so she's in the um colorado department of public health and environment in their air quality control division she's been doing this i guess now for like six years mm -hmm. and through her job does um advising consulting for other regulators so she can be able to kind of easily give you the download on it. Um, I was hoping to get her at the meeting, which was unavailable, but she was saying essentially most states have everything already in place um, and stuff. So um, I can do that to help give you a leg up on this. So yeah, no okay. worries. That would be fantastic. One one thing I would like to mention on nuisance odor is that, you know, you know we did run into a situation that was a process situation. And, and in that situation, it was, it was apparent they didn't have controls at all and it was apparent everywhere in the neighborhood and the and the the amount of complaints were, were so numerous that you know it, it it was easier for us to prove but one thing that is slowly creeping up that i'm i'm concerned about is the actual crops and and the growing of crops and the harvesting season and those odors affecting nearby neighbors um we have an active situation right now um that we're in the middle of 
And, you know, to be honest, I, uh, you know, I, I know what ag stance is on it. And, uh, you know, and, and like I said, the bar is high for a public nuisance for us, but um, it, it can tax our resources. And I just want to make sure that the board is is aware of that situation at all as well, because there, there are really are no controls for that. Um, so it's that's mm -hmm. when we when we get to a point where it's it's I think going to be a little bit more difficult to find a solution. I will make I'll make an introduction to you with um, Bayer Scientific. Uh, I work with them in a couple of my sustainability working groups, and I know they, they do have technology out there for outdoor cultivation, odor mitigation. What that is, I don't even know if it, you know, works or whatever, but um, yeah. Uh, but just, let, let me just jump in here, though. Yeah. I don't even know if our regs would apply to cultivation. Do you have a sense of they would, John? I, I I have not known any situation that our nuisance odor regulation does not apply to. Um, okay. I, I don't know of any exemptions. Right. Um, you no, know, one thing to think about when in terms of cultivation is I'm trying to prove as a violation, I'm trying to prove it as a public nuisance. Gotcha. Now, our, our public nuisance has not, we've not presented it as a violation that's gone in front of the courts many times. So I'm not sure how the courts feel about it. And to, to me personally, you know, when it comes to something like manure spreading, it's seasonal, it's limited in nature, you know, and this can also be, you know, is I'm getting varying reports from neighbors on how long the odor is actually lasting during the growing season. Um, and I think that depends on how adamant they are about the situation. Um, but, you know, I think it's actually personally a, a fairly high bar for me to prove that something that's occurring in a month to a month and a half, uh, you know, time frame is really a public nuisance when the rest of the year it is not impacting the neighboring properties. So that's something to consider. And uh, and again, we we unfortunately don't have a lot of experience in front of the courts with with something as limited that as that, uh, you know, in a public nuisance situation. So perhaps you know perhaps it's an area that we would not tread. Um, but but we're still figuring that out at this point. And I will say on that point for like the seasonality of it, I think for like greenhouses, outdoor, like full season, it'll just be at one specific time. If they're doing kind of like a light depth system um, or greenhouses, maybe three times a year. But if they're doing kind of a perpetual harvest indoor, they could potentially be um, harvesting flower every week. And so that way it would, would be a year round. Um, potential. Sure, sure, but that indoor situation, I think, provides a situation easier for controls to be added to the, you know, to be able to, to mitigate it. So absolutely. Um, and so I just wanted to confirm, Billy, when you were saying, um, since this is agriculture, that it would be exempt. Was that what you were? No, no. I just I was getting confused with our various air quality regulations, some of which are focused on like um, stationary emitters of different of actual air regulated air emissions. I was forgetting this is just a nuisance odor provision mm -hmm. which is different from those things which is more broadly applicable so that was gotcha. my own confusion mm -hmm. yeah and now that's what i think actually we're going to be talking about right now because we're going into the uh, air pollution control permit to construct um and so uh just about some figures i did talk to caitlin they're coming out with an actual uh study in the next month or two where they went in and actually measured the vocs within grows um and she was saying that their average is about five pounds of VOCs per ton of harvested cannabis, and that's total plant mass. And that, uh, I think the range was like two to 11, uh, but that is well below, she's saying five to 10 times below what like any kind of federal um, uh, air quality would come into play. So she was saying that it, it's not really a concern um, for mitigating like the VOCs from cultivation. Does that sound great, John? Uh, no, not exactly, because we do have a okay. state, we, you know, we do have state operating permits and state construction permits where, you know, on the federal level, uh, you know, we're a major source for a federal level is 100 tons a year of, of yeah. any pollutants or over 50 tons of VOCs. Um, our, you know, our state permitting, our operating permit is down to 10 tons a year. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, I can't do that math per bushel per pound, uh, you know, to, to determine where, you know, I'd love to see her study to see how, you know, how our rules would apply to what she's seeing as actual emissions. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in a construction permit down to, to five tons. 
Okay, that's good to know. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you. I remember she was saying it's it, it was a lot. It's like fifty, at least fifty thousand square feet, if not more, um, to get to that point. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, I just made a note that it's ten um, to uh, yeah confirm ten that for, ten tons for a state operating permit from us. Okay, um, and then um, for so. It looks like in the document that we had, it's you're estimating about 1,500 gallons of ethanol solvent lost or emitted um, per year for requiring a permit. Yes, and and forgive me that that came from my my permitting expert. Uh, so if if there's any unanswered questions here um, that I can't I can't handle, um, Doug would be able. He was out of the office today, so he couldn't join me. Um, but I can get them. I can get them back to you. I can get you answers in the permitting realm if I'm unclear on it uh, immediately uh, okay. tomorrow morning. Um, but yes, I think that's the that's what they calculated the the VOC trigger to be for our permitting threshold. Gotcha. Is there anything else in there, um, or that you, your department is concerned about, or you think that um, I guess with the permitting control um, would also need to apply? Um, for, I guess, any other, uh, like, manufacturing besides kind of this 1,500 gallons we're thinking about, so it's like the emissions part, but is there other specific requirements that would apply for either cultivation or manufacturing? Not that I know of, unless they bring in, you know, either larger scale boilers or engines as I mean, and, and you know, we didn't see and, and perhaps, you know, and maybe hopefully Vermont will get there, but we didn't see facilities uh, on the rise that quickly that would get to that size that would be requiring that equipment that would, you know, would require a permit solely for that equipment. Okay. If that makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah. And so I did a review of um, some general uh, I guess like requirements or regulations that we're seeing in other states that um, have required use of like closed loop extraction for, mm -hmm. um, except for alcohol based systems. I'm not quite sure why that's an exception there. Um, the prohibited disposal of solvents by evaporation or spillage. Um, and then having essentially an improved solvent list. Are those covered in current Vermont kind of regs with other industries um, or things that we should consider adding to um, the uh, CCB regulations. That might that might be one um, that I might want to confer with Doug Elliott, our permitting chief, on. Okay. Um, yeah, sounds good. And I can um, I have what those Colorado regs are, so I can send those to you, so you can look at how they're actually written. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think Jacob, if you can kind of queue up any of these questions that remain after today for for John and I, then that will make it easy for us to follow up on that stuff for you. Perfect. Um, and then um, Jacob, I have a, I just have a comment regarding okay. approved solvents for the purposes of um, botanical extraction within the hemp program. We do have a list of approved. Well, generally a list of approved technology, which includes solvents, um, in our role. Uh, and then as uh, if somebody wanted to use a different solvent or technology, we ask that we, um, that they get approval in writing from the agency um, so that we have a record of what we're approving and what we're allowing. So it's not related to air quality, it's just related to health and safety primarily. Um, and then I wanna say that the health department rules might have something, but I'm not, um, or, chat, or, or Title 18 might have something relative to extraction. But again, it's a, it's a, uh, public health and safety rather than a air quality kind of issue. And, and I mean, to clarify, if, if we had a, you know, if it was a closed loop system and it's not admitted to the atmosphere, you know, we, we actually don't have any jurisdiction over it. Um, so, you know, and, and I think it would really depend on, on, on the solvent, spe the specific solvent being used. Mm -hmm. uh, one, the reason I think that that, that was added to, um, to the fact sheet that we, we uh, worked on with AG was that we we had uh, we did a little bit of exploration about uh, after hearing something that that someone was using an HFC uh, I think 134A in a closed loop system as an extraction method and that was obviously that was that was news news to us and, and we didn't know and we started to look into our uh, HFC rule which is reasonably new which was copied from basically copied from a federal rule um, and it, it was a little bit questionable as to 
how that rule would apply and whether uh, the purpose would exempt that. And after some analysis and some talking to some of our, fe our federal uh, counterparts, we, we determined that, that it's fine to use that HFC in an extraction method like that. Um, so that's why that, that was, in the, the, I think that's what spurred the, 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 the bottom discussion on, our, uh, on the fact sheet that, that we handed you. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I had a question on that. And it's, it's, so, it's, sorry, so it sounds like you had a case where they were actually using it for extractive purposes. Um, Cause I was like looking at kind of, yeah, the hydrofluorocarbon stuff and it seemed like commonly it's used to like clean equipment and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I just had a question on, um, are there restrictions currently on the use of the uh, equipment that, that use HFCs um, right yeah. now? Yes, and I can I can forward you our HFC rule. It, it it definitely lists all the exemptions and and the specific HFCs uh, that are regulated by it. Uh, if that helps, uh, you know. And again, we weren't. I think that was just a proposed extraction system, and I don't know that we ever actually officially talked to that person. Um, but when it was mentioned, we started to do some some research into it, and I found I, you know online I found the actual extraction equipment that does use that. So we just kind of looked at that and compared it to our rule. But we found that our in the end we found our rule doesn't wouldn't apply to it because of the way it's used there. Gotcha. No, that that, that makes sense. Um, and then uh, yeah, I think it would be good just to yeah get that what that um, regulation is so we can just pass it along to the, CB, the CCB so it can, you know, get get noted. Um, you know, my understanding also is that even if it's a closed loop system, there are still going to be emissions of sorts, uh, specifically like even when it's closed loop, when they open it up to, you know, get it, it does, you know, off gas. And then I do believe with like the way OSHA and fire code, et cetera, with the amount of gas exchanges for like employee health, you know, that's like directed straight into the atmosphere. So, um, but most of the time when it's closed loop system, I think it's very low you know vsc emissions so it'll be definitely yeah. you know, should be under the 10 ton yeah. um requirement but we actually found in that advertising for that extraction equipment that they were let's just say vague on uh you know it being closed loop or or you know what was actually admitted and they it contradicted itself in a couple places but so that's something yeah. we when we look through but i definitely think it's probably like how it's used operations <laughs> sops trading you know all of that so um perfect uh then kind of on a higher level, um, which I'd love to get your perspectives, Billy and Stephanie, um, you know, there was a report that came out from Haley Summers, so I had a chance to like review it uh, with the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and wondering where Vermont stands currently on their goals, if they're, if we should be requiring, encouraging kind of carbon reductions or offsets um, when looking at this new industry, since there is like an opportunity to kind of set a basis, you know, as this industry is rolling out um, and wondering if, yeah, where we, where kind of Vermont stands right now, I guess with their climate change goals versus like, I guess like the compliance burden of doing this. Billy's gonna have more than me on this. <laughs> Sorry, I was just trying to be here for a second. Oh, um, it's a good question. Uh, the state is actively um, developing its first climate action plan right now. That plan is due um, on December 1st. Uh, we, the state passed uh, what's known as the Global Warming Solutions Act last year that set into statute certain emissions reduction uh, targets for 2025, 2030, and 2050. Um, those are applied kind of proportionally across sectors. So there is a, a reduction target for kind of the manufacturing and commercial sector. Um, I think those are gross reductions. So I don't know that kind of an offset or carbon credit approach would be one that would help the industry achieve or contribute to that emissions reduction um, target as set forth in the act. But that's certainly something that I can follow up with folks on a little bit more um, you know, my sense is that, you know, just encouraging efficiency, best practices, really trying to get people um, the, the right information and resources to do the right thing to the extent practical, you know, from the offset is, is probably the, the best approach. And then let the work of the, the Climate Council and others help direct more specific, um, you know, 
actions around emissions reduction. So that's my kind of initial reaction, but I, I am happy to, I haven't had the time to, but I will check in with the folks on that um, task group of the Climate Council to see if they have any additional guidance. Okay, so it, it seems like in line with what the PSD recommended for like, you know, kind of the high bar on equipment efficiencies um, for HVAC, et cetera, could be applied to maybe like requiring um, like a closed loop uh, um, system for manufacturing so that we're um, reducing um, as much uh, emissions as possible. Right. And if there's, you know, I think if there is certain technologies that have very high um, greenhouse gas, um, emitters associated with them where there's alternates that are, are less emitting you know i think either requiring or encouraging those alternates may be a way to go um you know or there may be you know ways to process and extract that have you know just really outsized greenhouse gas emission numbers versus others and you know it may make sense to strongly discourage or um you know prevent the use of those if it still allows for reasonable alternatives. Mm -hmm. I, I just question. don't know well enough whether those are part of the process or not. Gotcha. I have a question on kind of, I guess, how Vermont is looking at greenhouse gas emissions and responsibility. Is it a kind of cradle to gate approach? Like are producers somewhat responsible, like moving towards it for the um, like generation of energy that they're using? Um, or is it just in the manufacturing process? Like so currently we look at um, electric, like electric as a separate sector from manufacturing and commercial. So if you're a, a manufacturer or a commercial enterprise, you're not responsible for the emissions associated with the power that you're purchasing from your electric utility. The distributed electric utilities are the ones that are on the hook to reduce the emissions associated with the electric um, uh, power that is that is being uh, used in the state. So there's a separation there. Um, you're, you're as a commercial or manufacturing entity just responsible for your direct emissions. And that includes then transportation as well. Yes. Okay. Um, um, well, yes and no, because there's there's separate targets for the trans transportation sector, um, and I don't know how that I, I don't know how that would be managed. Whether I I don't know I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if they're they're taking into consideration kind of trucking or deliveries associated with a, a business as um, something that they're responsible for. Gotcha. Our, yeah. our emissions inventory right now is very coarse and doesn't really make some kind of generalizations about these different sectors. And part of what the Climate Council is doing is uh, issuing an RFI, then eventually an RFP for a consultant to help the state kind of rejigger the emissions inventory to be more um, detailed and granular to help us track these sorts of data so that we can have more nuanced and specific actions to address um, those emissions. We're just not there yet. We're doing a much more coarse thing right now. Yeah, okay. those, no, scope, those scope three indirect greenhouse gas emissions can be very, very hard to, to quantify, that's for yeah. sure. But yeah, Billy, this is, this is great and, and super important. I wanna make sure what we're doing here is, is in line with you know, with what the climate action plan is, is really looking to achieve and intend and, you know, offset programs, carbon trading, there's good programs and bad programs around the country, I think, if you look at it, and I don't want to wander into those waters if it's something that the state uh, hasn't done before, you know, necessarily. So um, Jacob and I had kind of had a conversation about it and just wanted to see how the state felt generally. Yeah, and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say hard and fast that that's not a good option here. It's just my sense that it might not help the sector meet the gross emissions reduction targets set forth in the act. But let me take that question back to the folks who actually have expertise on the council and, um, you know, have them reach out directly to you all yeah. uh, for that conversation because yeah. it, it, it may be an opportunity. Other state programs that run, you know, certain carbon offset trading programs, like I always think to California's low carbon fuel standard and stuff. The devil's always in the details and how that money that's being collected as kind of like a, a pay to play is is used, um, represented and you know, so on and so forth because if it's just like a slush fund, it can be open to legal challenges as well. 
Right, and I think that sort of offset program is what Vermont is considering more like sector-wide, you know, a low carbon and fuel standard, um, a transportation type program that's modeled on um, the REGI kind of regional greenhouse right. gas emissions program. So more kind of sector-wide efforts where um, you as an individual business aren't making those sorts of investments or allocations of credit. You're just part of a, a broader system that um, kind okay. of directs how you do your, your thing. That makes sense. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind just, just seeing where where ANR stands, generally speaking, that might be might be helpful for sure. Yeah, I will certainly do that. Perfect, yeah. And um, I didn't have a chance to, uh, so I was just going through the, the back end of that uh, research paper, but it looks like the range um, of uh, kind of CO2 equivalent emissions is around 2,500 to 3,500 kilograms per kilogram of dried flour. So I can do the calculations of what we're expecting from the sale of dried flour um, in Vermont and see kind of like where that, you know, on a macro level looks like um, in relation to other industries in Vermont. Um, one follow up question I had um, was Is there a lot of um, I guess geographic diversity of electricity production in Vermont. So if you're in one area, is this more from like coal fire power plants versus you know natural gas, or is it all pretty universal? Um, it's based on the contracts that the state district, the distribu the retail distribution utilities have with generators. So um, the way it works in Vermont is that there's. Um, you know, three or four large uh, distribution ut retail utilities. Then there's a number of small, smaller kind of local regional utilities. I think there's about a dozen or so in total, maybe more. Um, but there's kind of four big ones that represent the vast majority of the state. And those individual distribution retail utilities um, either manage or have contracts with uh, generators in Vermont um, or with generators outside of Vermont within our ISO region, ISO New England region, including uh, power that comes in from Hydro Quebec in Canada. Um, so it, there's just there's diversity amongst the utilities of how they procure their power. It's not necessarily tied to geography. It's just kind of how each utility does their thing in their most cost-effective manner. The real small municipal utilities often have existing hydro facilities or other assets that they've managed for you know a century or so that is producing a lot of their power. Um, we do have a renewable portfolio standard for electricity in Vermont. So all those utilities have a statutory framework through which they need to um, reduce the emissions associated with the electric supply on an incremental, in, incremental basis going forward. So that's how kind of electric side emissions are being handled. We already have a fairly low emission profile um, you know, nationally and, and for the region. So the electric sector is in relatively good shape and there is uh, good controls in place to, to clean them up even further. And there's a handful of utilities that are already 100% renewable, Burlington Electric being one of them. Okay, no, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, I bring this up because was looking at the research paper and then other things coming out of different states. And so it looks like, you know, um, from a greenhouse gas perspective, like greenhouses kind of reduce your overall CO2 emissions by like 42%, outdoor by 96%, but it's really contingent on the source. Um, so looking at it, it was like um, looking at a bunch of different areas, like in Colorado, you know, and they vary in you know, 19% give or take. And so they're looking at it from a policy perspective, does it make sense to try to encourage, you know, outdoor greenhouses in an area where it's sourcing from like a more of a dirty, you know, energy right. generation and not, you know, so. Yeah, we, you know, I don't have it in front of me, but there's certainly data of all the different distribution utilities and what the their current emissions are from their existing contracts. I think they're all within a fairly tight enough spectrum that there's no like outliers or like really dirty power geographically in Vermont that we need to be concerned concerned with. So I, I don't, I don't, I can understand in the West how you would see really drastic differences of where they are getting the bulk of their power. I don't think that's the case in Vermont. So I don't know that level of um, work would be necessary. And you know, we have one utility, Green Mountain Power, that it, I think covers about 80% of the state. 
So they're the vast majority of the power supply and they're very aggressive in their kind of emissions reduction goals already. And then, you know, you would be having to deal with a number of smaller utilities and the kind of the cost benefit there, I just don't think is, is there. Well, um, no, perfect. Um, uh, Stefan, do you have anything to add? And I also realize I didn't put on here really like pesticide fertilizer emissions. Um, I'm wondering if there is any gaps within the current, you know, regulations of your department that we should be thinking about. Um, I can't think of any, but I can certainly ask that question. Um, okay. Yeah, I will ask the powers that be. Sounds good. Yeah, my understanding is like it's not going to be too much of a concern. I mean, it also kind of depends on, and we'll probably talk about this in a later meeting, but like the do we want to make recommendations on um, material use in, in the cannabis sector as far as uh, soil fertility and, and pesticides um, and, you know, moving towards organic, requiring organic, you know, that kind of thing? Um. I don't. I, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think that's up to the cannabis control board um, mm -hmm. specifically, and obviously there needs to be third-party certification that's willing to to certify cannabis organic. And I know that there are. Like, I don't think there's a, a gap there. Um, we do have guidance generally um, with respect to use of pesticides on cannabis, just due to safety, public health. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I can share that list with you. Um, and then relative to inputs, I don't, I don't believe we have a recommended list um, for cannabis specifically. So, yeah. Oh, perfect, yeah. Um, John, I think there was a follow-up question I was looking at. Oh, um, with the how you guys do the error permitting, um, it is like standard, I guess, would be like estimate of the annual error emissions by like a mass balance calculation. Um, is that correct? Um, as, as far as the initial permitting or on an annual basis? Um, I would say the initial permitting. So when we're getting these licensees that are doing the application that I talked to your department, um, when you require, I mean, we did talk about it at the beginning, or I guess like before the meeting that um, you do have the capacity for guidance and to help do the calculations. I just want to ensure that the calculations that you guys are doing is mostly on like a mass balance kind of system, or is it are you actually trying to test the hazardous waste content? I would, I would think it might be on that, and I, I that, that's one I'd really, because I'd like to get you a, 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 a better answer that I can provide, but I can, I can email you, you know, like I said, I just need to talk to my permitting chief about that. I'm not sure how his engineers, I mean, I, you know, oftentimes we're using established emission factors from the EPA, and which I doubt there are many for this industry yet, um, but let me, uh, let me look into that one and I'll get back to you. I apologize. Oh. No, 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 that's fine. This was more of just, um, we had a, a couple of minutes and, you know, whatever we can make recommendations to the CCB that helps you, um, you know, we're more than happy to do. Um, I have been told that most of uh, like the states kind of um, oversee compliance of this issue, similar to like auto body shops. And that's kind of um, what they're seeing, like on that level of uh, indoor emissions of solvents is very similar to auto body um, paint shops. Okay. So that um, helps you at it's, all. Yeah, I mean, usually that is, I think, a mass balance for us. Uh, you know, when we're looking at that type of that type of situation. Um, but let me uh, let me confirm that, and I'll, I'll get you a more detailed answer. All right, sounds good. Um, and then we already talked about the progress report. Today I'm gonna try to get to everyone on my Monday. Um, do we have any public commenting, Kyle? Nope, not today. Okay. That sounds good. Um, we have a few more minutes. Um, I don't know, Billy, Stephanie, any any thoughts on anything we've done so far today or, or anything else? Or I guess we can adjourn um, our PCB. I, I was meeting went very fast and lots and lots of information. But did we talk about drying and using propane dryers and how that might come into play? No, we did not. Um, 
Well, again, I mean, for in our shop, it's it's the size of the fuel burning equipment and how much fuel is used to, to, to do that drying. And I don't know that bar off the top of my head, but but I think um, our permitting folks are under the impression that that, like I said earlier, that that's going to be a significant amount of equipment. And I, we're not, you know, maybe Vermont will get to that stage, but we weren't expecting it with initial, you know, initial uh, licensees. But we could be wrong on that. So, um, but yes, there there would there would be implications to to permitting uh, in our world, depending on on how big the equipment is that's used for that. Gotcha. And is that level for propane done on a, a propane used or a BTU um, level? I guess so. Like the size of the equipment or how much? Well, it, it, would be, it would be both. Um, you know, if, if they were looking to stay under a permitting size, uh, you know, or permitting threshold rather, um, you know, we would we would we would set a cap on the fuel that they could use to keep them under that uh, you know under that permitting threshold. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, and I was reviewing some um, regulatory guidance, um, kind of like on a, on a macro level, and there's a lot of kind of notes that getting a state air quality permit process takes a lot longer than the standard kind of cannabis application permitting process. I was wondering. Um, what your thoughts are on that because um, they're saying like, encouraging uh, potential cultivators and manufacturers to start the air permitting process early um, is very useful so that they don't get awarded an application in a specific area that then requires extensive you know remediation or, or would not be you know the best place kind of thing well i mean we don't we don't necessarily we don't have any non-attainment uh areas in in the united states i mean sorry in vermont um that, that would affect it on that level um you know we don't we we aren't really involved in the siting of the facilities mm -hmm. uh, you know and that's uh you know that comes up often with uh, hot mix asphalt plants for us uh where there are odors involved and 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 it's an industry that's can be controversial um you know i wish we could have more say in where they're cited because uh, oftentimes you know we have state bodies or local bodies that'll push something in because they think it'll help you know grow grow the municipality without a thought of the, of those you know actual impacts on on the surrounding area so i would love to have more of a say because then often it, it you know everybody points to us when the problem uh you know actually arises um but uh we we wouldn't have much of a say in in, in that uh more. in that instance gotcha. can i ask one more question jacob absolutely um, i i was actually just chatting with someone like the climate council who's working on these issues to kind of line up someone to respond to your questions and just to be specific the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the sector are primarily from drying and potentially transportation or are there other kind of main greenhouse gas emitting elements of production so um, what I've been able to glean, um, so for cultivation, um, the greenhouse gas emissions is from like equipment use and process. So it's actually um, from what they were saying in this report, like 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions from cannabis cultivation is from like non-traditional ag practices. So it's more like the indoor side. Um, whereas most of the greenhouse gases from agriculture come from um, land management, field prep, and then fertilization um, and the sourcing of that. This is like kind of the opposite. Um, so it's mostly from like the electricity being yeah. used to run the lights. Well, is there anything that's non-electric or non-transportation that is a significant source that you can think of? So terpene production, the plant itself actually produces VOCs, um, but that is apparently um, below issue. So that's a, kind of like the five kilograms uh, threshold, something like that. Um, and I think that's an annual um, thing, but I'll have to go through and, and clarify that. But yeah, so the plant itself actually, um, you know, off gases VOCs. Um, and then in the manufacturing side of things, it's the solvents mainly um that are a big contributor or potential contributor uh for it that's helpful yeah and as i said earlier i think you know the transportation and electrical pieces will probably be dealt with kind of sectorally and won't have implications on specific enterprises but the the manufacturing piece 
May, so I'll I'll try to get some follow up on that for you. Oh, and also it's like I think it's a minor uh, impact, but it'd be also um, on site generators. Right. Um, could be a significant source. I don't think it's necessarily a significant source, but depending on how they were used, most of the time it's for emergency um, power, uh, but sometimes also like supplemental power. Um, I know like there's a lot of kind of outdoor grows that are either run on solar or have a very low kind of like lighting water pump um, process, but then when they're harvesting, they might need generate generators to power kind of the um, drying equipment, um, like humidity control, all of that. And so it's like a really usually small uh, time frame. Okay. Yeah. Is it fair to say that many of the activities involved in cannabis um, cultivation, either in a greenhouse or otherwise, or in a field, as you mentioned, um, are similar to existing industry? I mean, I know scale can be a little different, but like we have indoor, you know, wood fired boilers that heat greenhouses in Vermont currently for um, production of food. Um, we have, you know, I'm, I'm just like, mm -hmm. it, it's similar to some extent, and but it is a new industry that we don't have. So it's an add on, but, um, but similar, right? Yes, I yes. believe so okay. from like a greenhouse outdoor. Yeah, there's nothing new. Um, that's not I mean, hard. even botanical extraction. I mean, we do have some, we have hemp, obviously, but I, I'm sure there are other botanical extraction operations in the state of Vermont that are, you know, doing other sources of um, botanical. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything um, new, you know, and I would imagine for the most part without, you know, a, a limitation on just the uh, capital cost, you know, you'd want the most efficient system because, you know, you're saving resources and this is also, you know, a very pretty valuable product once it gets to that point. So recapturing it and having, you know, is there's already that built in, I think, you know, business case for it. Um, I think really the newest thing would be like larger scale indoor cultivation, yeah. you know, could be on par with like data centers, you know, okay. big point mining, yeah. that kind of thing. So I don't know if that's a big, um, uh, you know, industry in Vermont, um, but it, you know, be comparable to that. And then um, I said another question, I guess, for John is, is there issues with ozone, uh, ground level ozone in Vermont um, right now, I guess, currently, and looking at like really requiring mitigation of that? Yet again, uh, you're a little bit outside as from com compliance and enforcement. Uh, you know, it's generally not a place because it's not from a specific source. It's not a it's not a place I'm, I'm deeply inv involved in. But yet again, when I'm I, I mean, I can certainly find that out for you quickly and add it to uh, the list of answers. Oh, yeah, um, it just uh, it's a big deal here in Denver. I mean, we have the most red days I think we've ever had kind of um, this this year. And so there's just been a lot of news about, you know, mitigating it. So when I saw that, like the VOCs with, I guess, the introduction of sunlight or the UV rays turned into ground level ozone, just wondering if that, um, you know, if, if Vermont as a state was like, uh, you know, really looking at that um, from like the, I guess, national air pollution like laws or whatever. Off the cuff, I, I don't think it's a, a, as, a lar as large of a problem in Vermont. Okay. And I, I don't think we're, we're eyeing up anything to, to better control it. Um, but again, I'd like to confer with a couple other people outside of the uh, permitting folks actually on that one uh, that would have a better idea. Oh, perfect. Um, Kyle, anything to add or we get to adjourn? I think we're good to adjourn. John, thank you so much for joining us mm -hmm. today and your, your um, undertaking of, of helping get us some outstanding questions answered. And like well, I to you, Billy, and to you, Stephanie. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I mean, in fact, you, 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 you know, obviously this uh, spurred a lot of uh, thoughts in my brain on, on, on being a little bit underprepared for this coming. So I, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the opportunity to think a little bit outside the box of what we, where we were thinking and, and kind of look uh, at how it's being handled nationally and, and, and make some comparisons there. So I, I do appreciate it. it's It's going to spur some work from us and that I think is a little overdue. So I appreciate it. You're not too far yeah. behind, John. We're, Thanks, all, John. we're all figuring this out day by day. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, I, and I'm the reason he's underprepared because I thought I told him we were doing this next week. So yeah, I, I'll take uh, yeah some responsibility for that as well, especially sending you all of his like 30 minutes before this meeting. So I think we did great for you know what we have to do. Um, awesome. Well, I will let the meeting adjourn. Thank you guys, um, and we'll have a meeting on Monday. Um, I, yeah, uh, no, we'll have a meeting on Wednesday. Wednesday uh, next week.
Wednesday, yeah. And I will get that um, I think Nell sent an invite uh, already. Oh, Good. perfect. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nelly. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you, guys. Bye. Right. Have you, a great rest of your